Welcome to Conquering Your Clownfish, a podcast dedicated to transforming disabilities into special abilities. I'm your host, Brady Murray. Welcome to the Conquering Your Clownfish podcast. I'm your host, Brady Murray. I am excited to introduce our special guest today, Amber Andrews. She is a wife, mom of three, stylist and salon owner, educator and advocate for an organic wellness company. She is also an unstoppable Down syndrome advocate for her daughter. In 2022, her life completely flipped as she embarked on this disability journey. Despite the challenges she faced that year, her journey has opened up a new life filled with pure joy. Amber, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to be able to visit with you today. For our longtime listeners, they're going to recognize that I'm actually in a different place. We started this podcast recording in my podcast office. And unfortunately, I had some technical difficulties. I'm in my other office now. So thank you for your patience with that, Amber. Of course. Well, I would love to give you an opportunity to share a little bit about your background and about your journey. We'd love to hear. Amber Andrews. I've been um, in North Carolina, born and raised my whole life. And I have been doing hair, gosh, for 18 years, stylist, salon owner. It was always the dream. It's something like even in my senior picture, my little quote in the yearbook was, I want to own a salon one day. So I've been working at that my full adult life. And I always knew I wanted to be a wife and a mom. And in my late 20s, we made that happen, got married, had my first child at 29, my second at 31, and then Andy, 33. It's a blur, really. <laughs> and, you know, we got our Down syndrome diagnosis when I was 10 weeks pregnant. And I remember, like, it was yesterday. I was actually working at the salon. And she was a surprise. We thought we were done at two. And so we didn't have any more baby stuff. And We were like, oh my goodness, I'm a planner. I can't take surprises. And so I wanted to do the genetic testing, which is not something I did with our other two children. And it was solely to find out the gender, just so we could start buying up baby stuff. Because the planner in me just couldn't handle that I had a baby on the way and no baby stuff. And so I was at the salon on Friday at 4.30, working on my last client. She was actually processing. Her highlights were processing. So I go to the back room and one of my stylists was back there and I got a ding on my phone. And I don't know how it is over the nation, but in North Carolina, your my chart, your medical records, they can ding your app without a doctor calling you. I did not know that prior. And it's something that I would really in the future like to fight for a change because I feel like diagnosis like this, test results like this deserve a phone call. It's not something that should be delivered on an app. And so yeah, I let me to- pause you right there and make sure, make sure I'm following that correctly. And so just with your health and wellness app that a doctor can upload notes or different things that are in there, your diagnosis was delivered via text message. It was not even on my radar. Honestly, I sat back in the back room with my stylist and I said, oh my goodness, we're get, we're about to find out if I'm having a boy or a girl. Should I wait for Graham or should we look? And she was like, I think you should wait for your husband. I was like, nah, let's open it up. <laughs> and quickly regretted that because the first thing in my, my test results was not the gender. It was your daughter has a 96% chance of having trisomy 21. When I tell you my heart fell Oh, it's taking me back to <laughs> when my heart fell to my feet. And I said, our daughter, and then I saw when she was going to be a girl, and I said, our daughter has Down syndrome. And you can tell my stylist so was like, not want to be a part of this conversation. But she wasn't prepared. She didn't know what to say. And I said, oh, my Lord, I have got to get home. I said, will you please tone my client with a 10 in? And I got to go. And my client was a longtime client. And I told her what had happened. She's actually a nurse. And she said, yeah, go, go. I'm fine. I'm fine. So my stylist took care of it. I ran home and all but collapsed in my husband's arms. And it's crazy, my reaction, honestly, because I'd always felt like the Lord had placed on my heart that I would have a special needs child. I'd actually talked with it about, I have a client that's a special needs teacher, and she had said the same prior. She used to say that, I'm really surprised I never had a kid with special needs because she's a special needs teacher. 
makes her passion. And I said, you know what's crazy is I felt the same way. Leave it. Even in elementary school, I don't even know how it happened, but I volunteered in elementary school for the, the St. Mark's class, kids with special needs and Down syndrome, cerebral palsy. And I would take my lunch period and volunteer in their classroom. So it's always been on my heart. But when you're placed in that position yourself, it's completely different because as a parent, you never want your children to struggle or suffer or be viewed by the world as different. In that moment, I also, not being a medical professional, I read the test results wrong. And I thought that there was also a percentage that she may have trisomy 18. And then you get on the Google. Oh. And the Google is terrifying. And being a Christian, I don't, there's certain things that I don't believe in. But in that moment, I, my human self, did not know if I had the strength to carry a baby to term and potentially watch them demise. And so, like, yep. you're just faced with a lot all at once and what, how you thought you would react is different and how it's just a wild ride. But the first time I realized that even though I was terrified, even though I cried myself to sleep the next morning, I woke up crying. This is where the magic starts. And this is where you can see how the beauty is coming from the ashes. And I rolled over and I would say that I'm usually glass half full, very positive in my marriage. And my husband can tend to be the other way around. And I rolled over to him sobbing, just woke up sobbing. And he grabbed me by my shoulders and he looked at me and he said, Amber, look at how beautiful our family already is and how magical and special it is. People want what we have. And this little beautiful baby girl, even if she does have Down syndrome, is going to make our family that much more special. And in that moment, God showing me like the partner I had in my husband that maybe I didn't truly really give him credit for it before, you know? So like, even in the hardest times, that was the first moment that I realized that this can be magic and we can use it for good. And I'm seeing how this, like what my marriage is made of, it made, made our marriage stronger just from the very beginning in the diagnosis and scary, traumatic pregnancy to say the least. We found out then after diagnosis, it was just like, bam, bam, bam. That was at 10 weeks. Of course, they transferred you to maternal fetal where at every single appointment they're asking if you want to continue the pregnancy and i had to let my southern roots come out one time and told them if you ask me that again put it in my chart we are continuing the pregnancy please quit telling me that at every single appointment and had to kind of get a little shysty with them until they so they quit asking but then at 19 weeks we find out that she has a big old hole in her heart and Honestly, the heart thing was scarier than the trisomy 21 because now it's just another layer of scariness. And that is when I hit my rock bottom. And two days after we found out about her heart, I got diagnosed with COVID and I was the sickest wow. I had ever been in my life. And I can remember for the first time in my life being mad at God. And it's weird and it's something I do personally, but I have a picture I take pictures of myself in crisis or bad times in my life. And I like to look back personally and look at that picture and realize how I was delivered from that and thank the Lord that I'm not there anymore. And like, it's just something I do kind of like a journaling thing. And so I remember full body aches, sweating, can't take anything for it because I'm so sick, but I'm pregnant. And then I have a special needs baby with a heart defect. And then I'm extra scared to have COVID because of all this. I have a picture of myself laying in the bathtub. We were renting our house at the time and all but sobbing. And I just clicked a picture of myself sobbing, hanging over the bathtub. Like why? Why me? Why us? Why one thing after the other? I finally made peace with Down syndrome and now her heart is broken and my heart's broken and now I'm sick. And then I have these other two children who I'm trying to be a rock for them, and I never wanted them to look back at this time and felt neglected because I was mentally struggling, you know? And so it is just layer after layer after layer. And I remember with my other two children, when my water broke, I was so excited. Both of my waters broke with my other two kids, and every time it's like, woohoo, it's go time. I'm so excited. Pack your bags. Let's get to the hospital. And with Andy, she was born December 28th, um, 21. And my water broke and I'm literally in the bathroom and I look at my husband and I just start sobbing. And he's like, what's wrong? Are you in pain? Are you, it's contractions. I said, I'm scared. 
I'm terrified. Like, yeah. you know what to expect with a typical child. You know, every child has layers. Of course, no typical child is typical. That's a weird thing to say because every kid is different. But you know somewhat what to expect. And I did not know what to expect here. And I knew from day one that she had Down syndrome. She didn't have any other markers, no nuclear translucency, nothing like that other than her heart. So I knew in my heart, I felt like a mama knows. <laughs> um, I think that my husband was holding out hope that she wouldn't have Down syndrome. And he kept saying, those tests can be wrong. And so in delivery, of course, you look down at her and the minute you see her, you know, And so what I had grieved my whole pregnancy and wrapped my head around and came to terms with, I had to watch him come to terms with it the minute he looked at her. And it's just been a wild ride, to say the least. But then when she was three weeks old, she wasn't eating well. Um, They had told us, worst case scenario, that she would have an open heart surgery. And this particular day... She just I couldn't get anything in her. She wasn't la- latching well. I couldn't bottle feed her. I had got maybe an ounce in her all day. But then I noticed the retractions starting. And every time she took a breath, I could see her ribs. And I knew something was wrong because I was a mother prior. And that is not normal breathing pattern for a newborn. And I sent a video to our doctor and he or just to go to the ER. And long, long, long story. She had contracted human metanumovirus, and we had never heard of it. I didn't know that that was a thing, but it's similar, if not worse, than RSV. And between her heart, her floppy little airway, and this virus, within 24 hours, she was on a ventilator in the pediatric CVICU. And we almost lost her numerous times. And... Nothing can prepare you for that. You know, it's just like one thing after the other, after the other, after the other. And knowing that you have two other kiddos at home that were so excited to have a little sister. And then you take her from them and they don't understand why both parents are home. Me and my husband were ships in the night. And then you lay her yeah. on postpartum. <laughs> and then you lay her on run into businesses and my cousin in corporate America. and. The only thing that I can remember is knowing that, like, God is good and we will get through it. And he would never give me anything that I couldn't handle with his strength. And I leaned on that and we just pushed forward. And by the time she was six months old, she had two open heart surgeries. She kept getting neck because her heart wasn't perfusing right to her gut and then have a few viruses more layered on top of that. and. It was the hardest thing that we have ever had to endure, but so much beauty because we did. We made it. And it just really shows you that life is not as serious as we make it. (laughs) And people think they have problems. And and I know everybody lives in their own reality. But for me, it's really made me just thankful for things that I took for granted prior. And watching this little baby struggle to survive for the first seven months of her life. And now she's walking and so happy and just takes life on the chin and keeps on moving. It just makes me want to be a better, stronger person. I know I don't know if I answered all the questions I was supposed to, but I get on a a tangent. And it's just, I watched God show up and show out so many times. I remember one day, and we lived 35, 40 minutes away from the hospital, the children's hospital. So it was a track too. And I was feeling sorry for myself one morning. Rightfully so. We are human and, you know, we fall short. (laughs) And I was mad a little bit, God, and I didn't understand why we were enduring this. And I was listening to my worship music on the way to the hospital one day. And I said, I am so, I was being ugly. I said, I am so tired of people's sympathy because nobody understands. And yeah, sure. Tell me you're sorry. Tell me you're praying for me and go on your beach vacation. And I'm just sitting in here looking out the hospital window like I was being spicy. And people don't know what to do. They were doing their best, but I was feeling angry. And I said, nobody understands. Don't have anybody pray for me no more until they can show me some empathy. I'm tired of walking this journey alone. And I can't make this up. So I pull on the parking deck. I walk into the hospital and the doctors and nurses were doing their rounds outside of 
Andy's room and we went over the schedule for the day and her meds and all that. And I sat down and I pulled up my Instagram and instantly after me and God just had a, a go around on the way to the, to the hospital, there is a woman named Julie and she is in my inbox on Instagram. And she said, Hey, you do not know me, but I've seen your story shared. She's local. And so she said, I, I've seen your short, your story shared. And I just wanted to let you know that you're not alone. My son, Silas, has Down syndrome, and he's a heart baby, too. And if you ever need somebody to talk to, like, I'm here. And she said, actually, we're in the hospital right now. He has RSV. And I was like, oh, really? What, what hospital are you at? And she told me. And I was like, oh, my gosh, me, too. Like, what floor? Same floor, right next door. No way. And so within an hour, she's bringing me coffee. And I have a friend. I have an empathetic friend and God is showing me, I got you. But another God wink recently, one thing that kept us out of church for a long time was her compromised airway. And she had a lot of laser treatments done due to, you know, all the intubations and extubations and emergency reintubations and the floppy airway. It was a disaster. We actually almost had to get a trait one, one time and we avoided that. But it kept us out of a lot of social situations. And recently, a few months back, I just felt the calling to get back into church and be in a physical place. And I couldn't fight it anymore. And so we found a church locally. And I mean, it's been a well over a year and we're set in the service and they're going over the prayer request and praise reports. And one thing that the pastor is praying about is a baby named Grace who is a heart baby, who has been in the hospital for however many months, and they're going to praise her board on her progress. And I was like, there is no coincidence that the same thing that kept me out of church is the first thing I hear when I walk back through the door. And it gets better. And then the pastor tells me, or not me, I felt like he was speaking to me, (laughs) but he tells that he starts telling a funny story about his brother that now lives with him that has Down syndrome. Oh. Is that not a wild? And then so it's just like, what is meant for you cannot be taken from you. And these children are blessings. And if you lean into it and see the grace and the beauty, it's undeniable. Like, I truly believe our children are, all children are gifts from God, but our special babies are angels on earth. And they are here to show us grace, to show us kindness, to show us perseverance. And it's a right. thing and it's scary and it's terrifying, but it's such a blessing and they teach us so much. And I, when they say like, we're the lucky few and people that don't understand that, I pity them. Like I pity people that have never got a close encounter with somebody that is a gift. Like there's just so much innocence right. there and it's just what was so terrifying and rocked our world to the core. like has been the biggest blessing. Like I will walk through any crowd with Andy on my hip. Like, look at me. God chose me. <laughs> How cute is she so cute? <laughs> so Amber, what a beautiful story. And thank you for being so willing to share just this journey of faith and those miracles that have transpired. A question that I have in my mind, I mean, Andy was born in December of 21. And so we're only a few years into this journey. And yeah. so it's still fairly new. And I would love to hear about how this has been for Graham. And so you had shared some in relation to when Andy was born and how that was his moment to be able to really process this diagnosis. But how's Graham doing now as Andy's dad and and just how's he doing? He's actually amazing. And I pity the person who ever says a crossword Andy's way, honestly, like he's the definition of daddy bear. But he's actually really stepped up. I mentally thought that I could go back to the salon two days a week. We got admitted in January of 2020 or 2022 and discharged the end of July. So towards the end of August, I thought, okay, maybe I can slowly start taking some clients again. And I said, but I cannot let anybody watch her. Like, I don't feel comfortable with anyone watching her medical professional or not like I've literally spent every waking minute with her since you know the day she was born and 
was for medical needs that just did not sit well with me. And he's like, well, if you're only going to work two days a week, I'll step out. I'll, I'll watch her on those days. So he works from home wow. Wednesdays and Fridays and watches Andy and they have their little routine and that out was her first word. <laughs> so, I mean, we really, just, yeah, it's precious. And so I just really feel like it's just worked out very easily. Like it, she's no different than her other children. And when I can't take her to therapy because of something he does, and we're just really kicking tail at this parenting thing. I'm just really so proud of him. And I couldn't ask for a, a better partner in this. Yeah. Wonderful. I'd love to hear how Mason and Lainey are doing as well. Mason and Lainey are obsessed with her. Honestly, it can be chaotic because they will get in fights about who's sitting beside her or who's holding her. And I have like the cutest videos when we first brought her home and we would discuss like that she has Down syndrome and we wanted it just be normal, like not something that they just figured out one day. And so it was really cute, all the questions they'll ask. And like sometimes, like just for instance, they fight like normal kids. And even Andy, now that she's getting a little mobile, she like reached up and pulled Lainey's hair the other day. And like Lainey raised her voice to Andy. And Mason was instantly in like, do not yell at her. She has Down syndrome. (laughs) Doesn't really. Yes. He's really protective. And it's really cute, too, to see how they're recognizing now, like children disabilities or differences and i've had to like kind of rail them in a little bit because like for instance we were at the beach and there was another little boy that had down syndrome and we were in an indoor pool keep in mind you know when you're an indoor pool that echo so loud yeah and it was just a couple families and us and andy was not with us graham had taken her upstairs for a nap so it was just me and mason elaney and the little boy that has downs he probably looked like seven or eight around mason's age and he was jumping in the pool and Mason just yells. It was like, oh, my goodness, Mama's not a Down syndrome, baby. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> like, he was excited and, like, recognized that this child was, like, his sister. And he thought that was really cool. But it came across, like, you can't just be screaming that across the pool. So I was like, you know, nope. I said, what? I said, yes, he has Down syndrome. I was like, but that's just one of the amazing things that make him, you know, who he is. And I was like, yeah. and I then. The parents looked over at us. I was like, his sister has Down syndrome. He just thinks it's the coolest. You know, so, and they're wearing, you know, their little shirts that say, my my sister has Down syndrome. And they love wearing their crazy socks on World Down Syndrome Day. And it's just really, really precious to watch them love her. And it's almost like they just are so upset. Like, they will just go to town on each other and nitpicking. And with Andy, it's like she can go wrong. So it's precious. Yeah, it's beautiful. I would love to hear, you know, I think it's the experience that you shared, although all of the additional layers that just my heart goes out to you on top of the diagnosis, on top of welcoming your child and so forth. And I would love to hear through that refining fire and what has transpired over the last couple of years, as you look back at pre-diagnosis, pre-Andy, look at your life there. And now look at it now, and you in particular, how have you changed? How has this changed you? I feel like, kind of what I touched on earlier, free Andy, you just focus on things that don't matter as much. Even like as you grow and get older, like your your circle of friends like get smaller, right? Like that's the type of stuff that would keep me awake at night. Like why is so-and-so not inviting me here? You know, like just little stuff that really doesn't matter. And like now it, how can I be the best mom I can be? How can I keep myself healthy to be there for Andy as long as I can? And like, I want to be the old grandma out there, you know, still hanging out with Andy. It's just my lens on life is different. and. I wouldn't change it for the world. Like when you see people just really down and out and complaining or upset about mundane things that don't matter, I would never want to go back to that. Like I love that they can live in a place of ignorance, you know, and because people don't know what they don't know and those that is their reality. But I wouldn't change my new perspective on life for anything because when, you know, your humanness gets involved, 
it's easy to worry about finances and career and house and things and travel. But when it gets down to it, it's am I creating good humans? You know, am I leaving a legacy for my children? Do they know about the Lord? (laughs) You know, like it's just our days are numbered. Like when we come into this world, we have an exit date. And living in the pediatric ICU on the PICU floor, not even just the cardiac side, there should not be something called a children's hospital. Children should be immune to sickness and struggle. And watching parents lose children. I I heard the screams, (laughs) like the things that I witnessed. I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And it just really makes you approach your day to day differently. How even how you interact with your kids, I think it taught me how to give my existing children a little bit more grace and enjoy their childhood a little bit more because they are kids and they don't know. And I just, it made me a better person all the way around. One final question before I let you go. And what a wonderful this interview this has been thus far. I would love for you to be able to share, share perspective and share insight, because I feel like your perspective is very, very fresh still. And so my diagnosis for my son with Down syndrome was nearly 17 years ago. Yeah. And in visiting with you, I'm reflecting back on those emotions and those feelings that were so tender and so pure during those first few months and years with Nash's diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But many of our listeners are families that are on the other side of this, that they maybe just received diagnosis or they just received or welcomed a child into their life that has, whether that's Down syndrome or a different disability. What Mm -hmm. counsel would you give them at this point in the stage where you're just a few years ahead of them you know, just a few years of experience under your belt, what counsel would you share with these with these families? Give yourself grace when you feel sad about it because it's okay to be sad. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to be fearful of the unknown. And it doesn't make you a bad parent. That's something I struggled with, that there's so many people that struggle to even have children, you know, and just because mine isn't what I perceived as perfect, I'm sad about it, you know, like, and it's okay. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to grieve the life that you thought you would have. It's okay to worry how this will affect your current children, but know that it will make life a lot sweeter. And every milestone is that much sweeter. And as you start climbing into those milestones too, they will hit them when they want to hit them, (laughs) you know. But what I try to do is, I just know that I'm giving Andy all the resources I possibly can and then allowing her to hit her milestones and take her time and just follow it along with her, you know? Yeah. Yeah, It's it's just okay to be scared and it's okay to not be okay, but take, just know that it will be better than you ever imagined. And I think right now, my biggest fear, and I, you can start feeling like at different stages, you can feel like the there's always going to be the fear of the unknown. And what I'm currently struggling with, because I think it's very important to be transparent when you are struggling and know that it's okay if it's not always fairy tales and rainbows. And what I'm currently struggling with is Andy is two years old and she is precious and everybody is gracious and shows love and kindness to a baby. But as she gets older, and the world isn't so gracious. And so that is my current struggle. But she, we have an amazing community and support and love. And again, I don't think that I can handle anything that's thrown my way. But the biggest thing that I do struggle with is as she gets older, will the world be so gracious and forgiving and welcoming to her? And I think that's why things like this are so important to normalize and show that, you know, she is worthy of inclusion and I just love that you've invited me here because we're on a mission to, you know, show people that there is beauty to it. And hopefully one day the world will will be gracious to our teenagers and our adults like they are to our little babies. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, One thought that came to my mind is you talk about giving yourself grace and mourning the loss and mourning the disappointment on the life that you maybe thought that you might have. What I have learned is that, well, I had the thought 
when I was, Nash was just a baby. And as I was getting over some of that grief that I was over it and that I had now through that and I didn't need to do that anymore. And I remember as certain milestones were missed or certain opportunities that I had envisioned I'd get to do with my son weren't realized. Yeah. Feeling that sadness and feeling that mourning coming back and actually feeling guilty yeah. for feeling that, thinking that by this stage I should be over that. Yeah. And that was a wonderful reminder that, that that's not the case. And yes. even now he's almost 17. There's still things that I experience and also things that I expect to experience that will probably bring some some mourning and some challenge will require me to give myself grace. Yeah. But on the flip side of that, I also remember feeling that fear of how will the world accept my son? And I can return and report now to you that by and large, the world has been wonderful. I love and that. they have treated him with so much love and so much empathy. And what I've learned is it's not so much that they're being nice to him. It's more that they're responding on how nice and kind and joyful he is to them. Yep. That they receive that and in return show and demonstrate that back to him. And my guess is, is that Andy will be experiencing the same. I love that. That special power and that gift that she has. So yeah, this has been a wonderful conversation, Amber. I am so thankful that we were able to connect. I wish you the very best. I hope to be able to meet you and Andy in person someday. I'm sure our paths will cross as our community is definitely tight knit and close. So thank you for being a guest. Yes. Thank you for having me. I hope so too. It was an honor. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conquering Your Clownfish. If you liked what we discussed on the podcast today and want to continue the conversation, please visit us at conqueringyourclownfish.com. And please don't forget to subscribe.